Welcome to SaaS Unlocked. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Austin. Austin is a co-CEO of Flyka, a compliance platform that empowers fastest growing companies to compete with larger organization. Again, I cannot just introduce Austin with just two sentences. I have like in a great description of him because he has achieved so much in his career with years of experience in, de in developing and scaling successful companies. Austin has gained wealth of knowledge and expertise in tech industry. So specifically today, he will share his insights and provide valuable advice on how startups can stay compliant while scaling their business with automation. Aside from his professional accomplishment, Austin is also a big bluegrass fan and white water kayaker, which speak of uh, speak to his diverse interests and well-rounded approach to life and work. Now, finally, so get ready to learn from one of the brightest minds in the industry. And please join me in giving warm welcome to esteemed uh, guest speaker Austin. Welcome, Austin, to SaaS Unlocked. Uh, you're too you're too kind. Thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm excited and um, uh, appreciate coming on. Uh, this one thing about like, you know, Austin and uh, like uh, uh, in no time, I think uh, you guys launched in 2019, raised almost $100 million Series C, right? Uh, so introduce us to Laika. Tell us your backstory about your co-founder. What inspired you guys to be Laika? Yeah, sure. So um, Laika is a compliance automation platform for um, digital companies to monitor uh, their security and privacy controls in real time and for streamlining um, enterprise vendor security assessments and undergoing IT audits like um, SOC 2, ISO 27001, High Trust. Um, there's a myriad of, of different digital compliance standards and Leica helps uh, companies take charge of, of all of it and manage it in one place. Uh, amazing. So maybe I will a bit more learn more about the co-founders. How did you meet them? Uh, just to have a like, you know, personalized element to this uh, 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 LinkedIn Live, it's more likely that people would love to know your journey and like, you know, how you started uh, and how you became successful in like just three or four years uh, since you began. Yeah, sure. So um, I have two co-founders, Sam and Eva, and Sam and I both come from um, enterprise software backgrounds. We previously built um, uh, two startups, two different startups. Sam's was an insure tech company. It was um, sort of like point of sale insurance. You could buy a policy on, say, a drum set at Guitar Center. Um, mm -hmm. My company was a data science company called Y Hat. Mm -hmm. And both he and I uh, encountered these enterprise security uh, vendor assessments and IT audits as enormous stumbling blocks in our prior lives as operators in our, our first companies. You know, mm -hmm. I think Sam had a certain level of instinct, uh, given that he was in the insurance world, that uh, meeting the requirements for big retailers and insurance companies was uh, sort of a day one investment he needed to make from a compliance perspective. Um, that being said, it was very, you know, he, he, you should have him on sometime and give you the uh, give you the whole saga. Uh, but long, long processes, trying to get through SOC 2 audits, taking many, many months, taking engineers off of writing revenue, generating code to write information security policies, et cetera. Uh, and from my perspective, you know, we, Y Hat was not in a regulated space specifically, but as we uh, took the, to the product to market uh, with bigger companies, Intuit, Johnson & Johnson, Square, you know, brands of, <clears throat> brands of consequence, uh, we encountered uh, this as a major growth obstacle, um, you know, later in the game as sort of a growth problem. Um, but in, in both cases, you know, he and I came to be very intellectually and commercially interested in this problem from the side of the vendor. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, e Eva, totally different profile. She was uh, managing director at Citigroup for 20 years, uh, overseeing wow. cybersecurity uh, uh, governance uh, third-party vendor risk management, um, essentially the entire institutional side of the bank's digital compliance rolled up under EVA. So she had seen the movie from the other side of the table for a long time with the bank, you know, trying to deploy major sums uh, of R&D dollars and struggling to do that with new vendors. Uh, and, and, you know, she, I think, was very inspired by what she was seeing in the fintech revolution in 2014, she left Citigroup to start a, a boutique consultancy, essentially helping uh, these internet companies a lot like 
my company and Sam's company meet these requirements, understand what the market uh, uh, expects of third party vendors, in particular software vendors, understanding what regulators are insisting upon for the same. And in, uh, you know, we got introduced through mutual investors, well, now investors, then just uh, VC friends in um, late 2018. And then, uh, you, you know, it was a it was a entrepreneur's love at first sight situation, I think, for all three of us. We were going to build something together and it was a perfect team up uh, opportunity, given that, you know, Sam and I are product guys. We know how to build stuff, um, but are not coming to this problem from, you know, years and years of, of compliance experience ourselves. And mm -hmm. Eva brings that to the table. And, you know, we got going. Um, I think we, we incorporated in the summer of 2019 and wrote the first lines of code. So we're coming up on, on four years. <clears throat> Beautiful success journey so far. Uh, and I hope that you'll take over the market uh, in the next couple of years. Automation has been increasingly <clears throat> a critical component of uh, modern business operation, right? So in the last four years of your business, uh, I'm sure that, you know, trends that we're seeing in AI, uh, and automation, how do you consider the key factors that contributed to your success in Leica? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about this. So the there there's a there's a, a an old and and sort of sleepy and tired software category called GRC, governance, risk, and compliance. Mm -hmm. And this is like if you if you imagine a, a, a compliance team at a at a big bank or a, you know, at a hospital, they sit down at their desk in the morning. Uh, GRC is the software that they're using historically to do their job. And there's a number of, of uh, sort of evolutions uh, in, in, in particular, AI and automation uh, that uh, really get us excited about dramatically changing the way uh, compliance professionals do their work. Uh, in, the first is sort of uh, the, the massive adoption of SaaS tools and cloud infrastructure and the API, uh, the APIification of virtually everything today, you can now uh, programmatically access a lot of the metadata and um, uh, other sort of operational data related to compliance in a way that uh, would be only accessible manually by somebody literally going in and reviewing something, reading something, um, you know, by, by hand. Now there is just an explosion of digital exhaust that is available uh, for um, you know real time monitoring and doing a lot of the compliance legwork uh, as a, as an expression of code programmatically, where in the past you just could never have done that, and that provides a, a number of of of, of uh, benefits. The first is it's uh, there aren't enough compliance professionals familiar with these digital standards, so we. Uh, as sort of a, an industry need to equip those professionals that uh, are out there with the best possible tools to do what they need to do quickly. Uh, we also need to reduce the, the likelihood of errors in this domain. You know, the, a lot of this stuff can be very dense, complex uh, to a, a, a lay person or someone unfamiliar with a lot of the concepts feels uh, a lot like jargon and you may not understand everything. And all of that adds up to um, the, the high probability that mistakes can get made, edge cases can, can happen behind the scenes that you don't know about. Um, so automation is a, an incredible lever uh, in that the robot doesn't, doesn't miss things, right? If you design mm -hmm. um, automated compliance checks uh, in a way that, uh, you, that is um, uh, comprehensive, uh, you sort of set it on autopilot and it's behind the scenes, uh, which gives a lot of peace of mind to regulators and security teams and so forth. Excellent. So you've been into the startup world for a while, right? And uh, when you are working on a product in your very really initial stage of your journey and you're trying to get that first 1,000 customers, 500 customers, whatever it is, right? And startup has to like you know grow at speed right 20 percent 30 percent month or month growth that we are looking for uh how can like you know uh, one implement uh, automation to focus actually on the product side of things and scale on like you know capturing the market how do you see automation like you know uh, stay ahead with the competitive landscape that we have 
Well, I think the the just ge speaking generically about uh, building a, building products, you want to offload all of the things that are unrelated to uh, the 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 intellectual property or the novel uh, solution that you are are trying to bring to market. For most companies, unless you're building, say, a payroll company, it's best to work with a, a, a provider like Deal or, or Rippling or JustWorks, right? Similarly, it, it, you, you find all kinds of interesting tech-enabled services providers that are uh, making it a lot easier to uh, create startups, uh, back office tools like Carta and Pilot in accounting. Um, it, it, th these are sort of ways for the average software team to become a proper business uh, instantaneously, you know, turnkey, which is precisely what we're trying to do for our customers uh, with respect to digital compliance. You know, the, the, the people that are revolutionizing um, pipette science in the laboratory or inventing mm -hmm. the next uh, Slack or Discord chat experience or building the next, uh, you know, Miro workflow uh, collaboration platform, they don't also need to be spending all of their time on all of the other things that they may not be familiar with and that certainly don't specifically um, create the enterprise value as part of the solution that they're getting out of bed every morning to work on, right? So finding those opportunities is, is huge. And, you know, the, you the scarcest all? resource of all is time. So, you know, I, I want my engineers thinking exclusively about digital compliance problems and how to solve them in elegant ways and create great experiences for our customers, specifically with respect to compliance. I don't want them reinventing the wheel on all kinds of other stuff that isn't core to that mission. Absolutely. When you talk about all of these tools, let me just have a word about like, you know, outsourcing part, right? Uh, Insidia is like, you know, uh, a leader in the space in terms of helping companies outsource remote talent. Uh, we've been here for a while. Uh, and how do you see this outsourcing uh, part uh, impacting your business growth? And specifically, like, you know, some tasks are not uh, or cannot be automated. It requires human intervention. Uh, and that task can be like, you know, given to someone else. For example, can be customer support. It can be other side of the businesses, right? Even like uh, development. So how do you see that fits into your automation or scaling strategies? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think for starters, we're all Zoom children now. I think the, the, pan the pandemic sent every company into a remote first or at, at a minimum, a hybrid remote situation uh, so far faster than, you know, it would have occurred naturally. And I, and I think it's fair to say whatever uh, relationship we all wind up having to physical offices will be different than it would have been, you know, it, 2019 and, and before. Uh, and that unlocks a lot of uh, exciting opportunities for remote collaboration. Uh, from the very beginning, like, uh, you know, we, we got going, like I said, in summer of 2019. And uh, uh, my, uh, my senior director of uh, uh, engineering he and I have worked together for like 13, 14 years. He's a Costa Rican guy. He was employee number one. He hired all of the engineers, you know, for, for the uh, first three and a half years. And we just knew that we were going to be a substantially remote company. And of course, the pandemic hit. Uh, and the, uh, those of us that are in the United States had to change our work. But we already had, you know, made the commitment culturally to have a substantial portion of our workforce namely the software engineering team, uh, largely in Costa Rica, but all over pan Latin America. And so, so that's just from our side. I mean, we've just embraced um, hiring the right people wherever we find them. Uh, and we've applied that same thinking when it comes to thinking about contractors who are not full-time. We work with all kinds of you know, digital agencies on all kinds of different things. And um, we, get, we get a lot of leverage out of that. And I think that I'm not... Uh, unique in this sort of thinking, uh, you know, I, I talk to CEOs all the time uh, who are making very similar um, choices to invest, in, you know, on their team specifically uh, in a certain way and finding very, very talented specialist organizations to help them create leverage in things that are not core to their to their business. 
And then the last thing I'll, uh, I'll um, speak to on this particular question, because you, you mentioned automation. Mm -hmm. I think like specialists uh, in across all different domains are going to be increasingly equipped with um, very domain specific workflow tools that are powered by AI. Uh, that could be document extraction stuff and processing you know, data uh, all the way through copywriting and, you know, uh, creative, I mean, the creative uh, field overall, I think will change. Um, but the, the humans are, uh, on my view, will become drivers. Uh, they, they're not going to disappear, right? You know, just uh, out of like when we are talking about AI and chat GPT and stuff like that, I asked chat GPT, like, you know, I'm, I'm going on an event, a LinkedIn Live event with Austin. <laughs> and here's a topic. Can you give me like 20 questions on uh, what I can ask Austin, right? It came up with like, you know, questions with answers that I can like ask you. It's like, you know, if I had to have somebody work on it, it would take like two, three days for a person to come up with questions and answers and all of this stuff. It can be done in like two, three minutes, which is amazing. So I'm I'm very bullish on like you know uh, AI uh, incorporated with uh, all of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so completely agree on that point. Uh, so Austin, from your perspective, um, maybe if you can list down uh, three effective tasks to automate and scale. Uh, it can be like you know uh, automating repetitive tasks or using some tools that you mentioned or leveraging AI or whatever you think, which is like, you know, <clears throat> top three on your list that can be very effective for scaling. Uh, specific to our business or just generally areas that, mm -hmm. I, that I'm like keeping an eye on that, that are interesting to me? Uh, that are interesting to you and that can be like, you know, implemented to any business startups are running. Yeah, I, so I, I think document processing and data extraction are, are, they've really come about recently. I mean, some of these tools for um, labeling named entities and finding particular uh, pieces of content that are, you know, hidden in uh, everything from public documents that are in PDFs on various websites to, um, you know, underwriters looking at uh, loan documents and financial statements and stuff like that. The tools for processing that and converting it into structured data is just unbelievable. So there's uh, a lot of stuff is going to change with respect to anything that involves emailing PDFs around the internet. Um, I also think um, in the creator space, for, for sure, there will be, uh, like, you, like you said, uh, prompts for copywriters uh, will dramatically increase their productivity um, and... Um, you know, in our world, uh, there's a lot of uh, documentation with respect to vendor compliance uh, in enterprises. Um, you know, we think a lot about uh, how, how can we improve the process of um, an enterprise procurement team uh, evaluating the security measures of the vendors that they trust to do business with. You take like uh, JP Morgan, uh, for instance, they have something like 5,000 vendors, almost all of them are software vendors. Um, every vendor has to go uh, through an assessment at least once uh, per year and certainly initially. Part of that is a human literally has to read every policy that these companies um, have with respect to securing systems and securing data. Mm -hmm. these, these types of uh, document extraction um, capabilities are like front of front uh, front and center for us when we think about improving the process of bringing new technology into a big company like that uh, because it's such a time saver, right? Absolutely. So uh, we we all are looking for you know rapid scaling, right? Uh, and uh, being a successful entrepreneur, and you have did it already. Uh, so. What were some of the things that uh, helped you in your journey at Leica uh, that has led Leica to raise 100 million series C round in just three years? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the, the biggest part of the answer is you, building something that, that people actually want uh, to use. You know, I think there's quite a lot of um, discussion in startups, venture capital sort of ecosystem about product market fit. It really is a phenomenon that's worth paying attention to because um, 
until you have a product that can be sold not just by you at great a, a great task at great expense but by anyone you might hire on your team um, mm-hmm. a product that can be purchased without a great deal of um, customization you aren't r- really ready to even answer your your rapid scaling question like the first bit is do you have a product that matches the the problems elegantly that uh, your customers have and once you have that then you can start to think about um, you know wh- which sales channels are going to work is this a product that is bought or is this a product that is sold mm-hmm. where are your customers uh, hanging out are they um, at conferences or are they on Twitter and I think the rapid scale question certainly depends on what it is you're doing you know we chose to start with um, you know, our, our sort of core audience from 2019 uh, to 2020 was largely venture-backed digital companies, particularly those that are in um, fintech, uh, insurtech, digital health. Companies that were operating in a regulated space tended to come with a certain level of instinct about um, this compliance stuff being essential for them uh, very early. Now in 2020 and 2021, we saw the already large tailwinds behind SaaS adoption and cloud adoption at enterprises really just got uh, dialed up to the max. The pandemic sent everybody home. How do big companies y- y- adapt in that environment when they used to be all in the office? Well, you have to buy a lot more software. And uh, that really accelerated our business as sort of a fundamental um, macro adjustment where there's just vastly more um, risks that are being taken on through the mass adoption of these tools. So our customers were underwater with respect to you know these these assessments. Now you can't uh, induce a pandemic. Uh, one one would hope, anyways, you you wouldn't want to. But looking looking at trends uh, like this and and being able to react and adapt to them and take advantage of whatever opportunity um, there there is with respect to the overall sort of uh, climate and atmosphere in the, the macro environment is important. There's a question from Diana uh, from the audience. What factors can be automated for digital compliance? And when enough is not enough and digital risks are too much, I uh, would like to take part of that one. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, a lot of the digital compliance controls are um, bound up with people, processes, training, And a lot of it is bound up with uh, technical configurations. So um, with respect to our customers, our customers log into Leica and they connect all of the tools that they use to run their company. So you're connecting GitHub, you're connecting all of your AWS products that you're using, uh, as well as your your HR system and uh, various tools related to the way that your company um, handles data. And then behind the scenes, what we can do with that information is we can alert our customers, oh, uh, one of your software engineers has pushed code and merged it into the master branch without having undergone a code review. Uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, when you're going to market with a big company or if you're uh, you know, handling PHI, uh, it, it's, it's a set of laws. You have to be doing certain things demonstrably to uh, uh, meet these requirements you can automate the process of, of checking that all of these activities are uh, indeed happening. And you can automate the, the, the process of remediating many of them too. So if Leica detects some problem, uh, mm-hmm. it can, it can uh, alert your team to take action. And in certain cases, it can take action itself. And when you talk about this specific topic, maybe I can like, you know, just in, just add to this question, like how does this challenge uh, impact the operation and the growth side of things? If you can be more specific on like, you know, what uh, is the problem statement here for businesses, which actually leads them to like, you know, facing challenges on the growth side? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll work from an analogy or uh, an anecdote. Um, JP Morgan, like I said, has, has 5,000 vendors. If you're trying to be one of those vendors, you're trying to sell into that company, um, you should be aware that they have uh, a very, very advanced uh, risk uh, 
uh, process, risk evaluation process for vendors. They classify you, that's the first thing they do, into different risk tiers, uh, negligible, nominal, low, medium, high, and critical risk, depending on which risk tier they classify you into. That will dictate what uh, level of, of assessment or review they do of your technology. And that could be everything from, uh, you know, not doing any checks at all. If you are, you know, a food vendor, uh, they're not going to ask you to, to uh, demonstrate that you have, you know, encryption standards. This doesn't make uh, any, any sense, obviously. Uh, on the other hand, if you're deemed high risk or critical risk, you are being audited by JP Morgan's security team all the time. And um, that is a go-to market problem. Yes, it's a risk mitigation problem uh, because that's fundamentally the reason that JP Morgan or any of these big companies does this stuff at all because they have huge brand risk. They have enormous sums of customer data. Um, it could be a total catastrophe if they let a, a particular vendor in that represents a serious technical weakness or uh, operational weakness of some kind that uh, opens them up to true cybersecurity risk or just bad acting by accident. So you want to be in a position, A, not to be that company at all for reasons that are, are uh, self-evident, but you also need to connect it to the, 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 the growth question, which is if you want to be inside JP Morgan or Yale New Haven Hospital or Delta Airlines, um, they're going to ask a lot of things about your security controls, your data hygiene, et cetera. So it's both a bottom line thing and a top line thing for software companies. Thank you for sharing that. On top of it, like maybe, you know, when we are building this conversation, now we talk about like the problem statement, growth statement, maybe like, you know, implementing this automated comply solution. Like, you know, what are the steps that involved uh, when somebody is looking to implement this uh, uh, security or compliance solution? Yeah, it, it's super simple. Um, customers uh, log in. Uh, during onboarding, they connect all of the tools and systems that they use to run the company. And the first thing that they're going to see is Leica will, will give you a sense for uh, what controls you already have in place that are operating effectively. We can do this because a lot of the controls are technical. We can say, uh, oh, you need to comply with HIPAA and SOC 2 standards. Um, well, we've scanned all your stuff and we know for a fact that you're already doing a lot of the uh, technical controls the right way. Uh, and then from there, it's a matter of um, going through a TurboTax style guided uh, sort of navigation for implementing whatever controls are not uh, yet implemented. And on Leica, that's just a very um, clean UI with, with elegant steps that are simple enough to follow, even for uh, folks who are not you know, coming from a compliance background. We've tried to make um, that experience as, as simple uh, and, and easy as possible to follow. And also we try to educate along the way because it, our customers get a lot of value from being able to uh, speak with confidence and authority on topics that relate to compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, and by, by embedding a sort of um, edu education layer as part of the implementation, you know, I think it, it, it helps level up um, a baseline understanding uh, across teams what these requirements are, why they matter, et cetera. And usually it just takes a couple of weeks total for companies to get through it. Uh, it can be a couple of days if it's a smaller company, but it, it really is uh, not, a, not a tremendous burden to, to get started here. Just like having, uh, just need a bit more clarity on Leica's front, right? So when I'm using Leica, so uh, having those uh, certificates that are required uh, in compliance perspective, if I'm using Leica, uh, is it something that I can say it on my side that now I am like, you know, HIPAA compliance uh, vendor or partner or whatever? How does that work? Or I need to apply to the organization directly uh, once I use Leica? So it, it depends on, on which standards you're talking about. Um, a lot of these standards require a, a um, outside independent audit in order to represent that you are compliant with a particular standard. So for instance, SOC, SOC 2, you have to under, undergo an audit. On the other hand, HIPAA doesn't have a strict uh, external independent audit as a requirement. It does uh, require that you um, 
do what's called a, a self-attestation. This is basically broadcasting that you have uh, actually done an audit of your own systems and, and um, that you are indeed representing that you comply with the HIPAA rules. Uh, so each standard is a little bit different and that, that includes the, the vendor processes at all of these different companies. So as much as it would be delightful from uh, a go-to-market perspective for any B2B software company to say, uh, I have done compliance and raise your hand and you know it, it's a once and done situation, there really is a lot of nuance and each buyer is going to be a little bit different. A lot of them will insist upon their own controls being tested um, on top of a SOC 2, on top of an ISO. Uh, while others will say, oh, great, you're SOC 2 compliant, no problem, you can, you can uh, fly through the uh, vendor review process because we, we trust that the auditor uh, has created a great report and tested everything we care about. It just depends. Bit off topic here, but there is some <laughs> question from the audience that we are sure. talking about. Uh, so it's, uh, there's no doubt that automation and AI uh, are uh, present and the most uh, definitely in the future. What are your views on the current debate that says AI will kill creativity? <laughs> Uh, um, I, I, I'm worried about it to a certain extent. I mean, it really, that's the, if, 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 if human flourishing uh, it has, has been pegged to anything in the history of, you know, hu mankind, it's creative endeavors. I, I do think the, the, like, large language models are only as creative as the, the in information, the volume of data that they have access to. So yes, you can ask it, G, chat GPT for prompts related to certain things, but uh, in, until it has uh, been trained on you know, literally everything, there still will be the need for a human to uh, write good prompts for the, the software to even work in the first place. You know, actually I feel it is gonna enhance the creativity because Let's say I'm I'm into marketing, so I I know like you know what copywriting is and how I can like you know resonate with the audience and like create that kind of virality, create that kind of hook, right? But at the end of the day, I still need a copywriter to yeah. implement that ideas into reality because I'm focused more on the strategy side of things versus uh, 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 the copywriter's creativity. Like the prompts that you mentioned are equally important. But now, actually, I just ask AI, like, you know, hey, I have this idea about tweet, okay? Uh, let's say I want to focus something on, like, you know, how startup can, like, you know, use brand uh, or have a customer obsession on the brand and, like, you know, write tweet on it, for example. It will come up with 20, 10 tweets uh, and I can select whatever I want. So it gives me more ideas and enhances my creativity. Uh, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And... Again, some jobs might be compromised uh, because of AI, but I think more will be created on top of it because AI is going to, like, you know, change the way we work and how we work. Uh, and, like, it will help us go and run faster. Uh, there's one question from audience that I would like to take. What are the best practices for streamlined automation for continuous compliance? And I think also maybe it's also in my mind when we say that we did first check how do, you, how do we make sure that we are continuously making sure uh, that we are like compliant and have that kind of like, you know, uh, a culture within our organization to make sure that we are uh, making sure our data is uh, clean and safe? Uh, I mean, I, I think you, your, your question has the answer embedded within it. Honestly, it, the, if you implement this stuff at a, at a fairly early stage in a company's life, you you really uh, set yourself up to succeed in the future when it's culturally just the way you operate as an organization and these compliance controls just exist uh, versus if you implement these controls retroactively once you've scaled you have a cultural sort of hit that you take because people have to change the way that they work right if the marketing team knows that this is the way that we uh, handle emails and other uh, pieces of uh, personal information, uh, and, and they, this is the way we've always done things. If engineers undergo uh, code reviews and have a certain process in place for the way that they 
um, you know, do their release cycles, uh, or if you always maintain a disaster, re a disaster recovery sort of failover script and you update it with each release, whatever the, the organization does it, habitually, the norms and traditions that you use to run the company, if they happen to be compliant in the beginning, nobody notices once the company is big that there's any burden versus if you have to change the way every, everyone on uh, all of your teams are doing their work. That can be very tricky to, to pull off, uh, you know, from a cultural perspective. People, people don't like change. Moving the ship can become difficult, right? I'm, I'm seeing like, you know, we started with automation, but I think people are loving uh, the conversation we are having on the compliance side. And there's one more question came in, like, does every company in the world need like our compliance solution? If you're selling... If you're selling B2B software, most certainly the answer is yes. If you even employ a single software developer, the answer is probably yes. The reality is re regulators are, are often behind industries and there, there is increasing um, interest and, and uh, awareness of digital security, digital privacy among regulators, obviously in uh, Europe, they, they're sort of pioneering um, privacy legislation to protect consumers, uh, but, but the, all of that stuff is coming, right? There will be more compliant uh, uh, regulations in the future, not less. And I think, you know, as a, as a builder, as an operator, as a, um, you know, entrepreneur, that can feel intimidating and it would be amazing to be able to click a button and have all of these problems disappear. But taking my entrepreneur hat off and just like my putting on my citizen of the world hat, I, I, it's a good idea, uh, honestly. Like big tech has not necessarily impressed me with respect to the large volume of misadventures and data breaches and bad acting and accidents and all, of, all the rest. I, I, I think we do want um, this sort of trend uh, as a uh, as a leveling up across the board with respect to the the companies that we trust with everything like everything that you care about is in your phone right every every transaction and all of your patient uh, you know personal medical records all your family photo like whatever you might care about is represented in in a digital way and we should expect tech companies to protect it. Absolutely. Hey, Jake, uh, thank you for the question. Historically, audits have been the point in time activity. How does Leica think this will change the continuous automation? And what are the key benefits of the companies uh, of this for this? So audits, it's a, it's a great question. Um, all, IT audits are increasingly, yes, performed uh, in a moment in time, but they are not uh, strictly auditing data from a moment in time. Uh, auditors are looking backwards over, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months and looking to evaluate controls as, as of any random date in the past. And they're doing this to make sure that uh, your, your control was indeed operating over the entire period of time that you, you said it was, that you can't just set things up and the, the day of the audit and expect uh, an auditor to bless that anymore. Uh, I think that that probably was the paradigm uh, several years ago, but given the availability of digital exhaust that we can now get at programmatically, auditors have a reasonable expectation that if you say that you are enforcing multi-factor authentication for all critical systems, well, I want to see that you indeed were doing that six months ago and they're, they're checking. So it, yes, it, the audit is performed at a moment in time, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can get away with a sort of once and done activity with the auditor. You, you need to be able to furnish proof uh, that you have been operating your controls pretty much whenever, 24 seven. Audience is quite active and asking a lot of questions. Thanks uh, for that. Let them coming in. We have more 15 minutes to go. Uh, there's a question from Dinah. Uh, what are the key factors that small businesses could consider when deciding which automation strategies to implement? Should small business aim to implement all available automation strategies 
are there certain areas that you should prioritize based on the potential impact on the business? I mean, I, it, it's tough to answer uh, with, without knowing some of the specifics of your business, but I'd say generically, think hard about what your unique uh, magic pixie dust needs to be for your customers. Like, what is the thing that really matters for your company? And find areas to, to create leverage with automation in every other part uh, of your company except for that. Um, free yourself up and your, your team up um, to, to worry about that, that center of the bullseye. The thing, whatever the pixie dust needs to be, the, the thing you guys need to be the best at, that's where you want to spend your time. Automate as much of everything else that you can. Thank you. Uh, I think we already covered this question, but maybe we can just shed some more light on like, you know, what advice you would give business who are owners who are new to compliance. Maybe if you can give like a couple of tips on how to get started. Totally. Uh, I mean, th this this may be, sound self-serving, but that's very much what we're in business to do. Um, find a partner, whether it's Leica or another, uh, that can that can help you, that can serve as a, as a uh, helping hand, can provide that baseline education. Um, you know, you can't be every kind of professional simultaneously, right? You can't be a finance uh, professional and an expert in machine learning and an expert in, you know, uh, compliance and a lawyer. Like th that's a fantasy uh, resume that is like 10 careers in one. So, mm -hmm. you know, Compliance is like any other uh, part of the organization where you can find partners uh, and, and like Leica or others that um, can help fill gaps and provide provide the education that you uh, you're looking for. Maybe I will request you to now wear your entrepreneur hat and like <laughs> you know, help other entrepreneurs around the world who are listening to us. Uh, some of the tips that you can share if they're looking to launch their successful product. Oh boy. Well, I built a lot of products in my life. Most of them bad, uh, a few of them good and have a thick skin. Don't be wedded to uh, ideas just for the sake of it. Um, really, really think uh, and, and care deeply about the problem that your customer has and less uh, fixation on your version of what you intuit the, the solution needs to look like or ought to look like. Be mm -hmm. open to the possibility that um, you need to you know, throw, throw it away and start over. Uh, that's not a bad thing. I think on some level, startups, um, they, they are experiments. Like that's the exercise. The job is to walk the parameter space of problems and solutions uh, and find the right match between those two. And sometimes that means, you know, abandoning something that's not working. Uh, the, the trick is that you, you also can abandon something too soon, right? There, there is a balance where you need to give things enough time, but not so much time uh, that you're just spinning your wheels on something that's never going to work out. And that's a dark art. That's, it's just, that's tricky. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, what are the trends that you've been seeing in the industry that could affect the way business operate in the future? The remote thing is very real. Uh, it, it's sort of obvious, but uh, that's a big one. And that's the, why I'm, the, this. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, I, I, I think AI and machine learning is a big one. Obviously, everybody is paying close attention to um, generative AI and what that's going to do. Um, I, I, we're going to see a lot of the same with, uh, you know, logo design and perhaps, you know, music and uh, all the rest. I think um, those are um, going to be... So music is like, you know, I, I actually interviewed a couple of uh, startup founders uh, with music AI. It's incredible. Like, you know, you just... Mm -hmm. You can just design your own music. You know, the power is in your hands. You don't have to, like... I was like, you know, recently uploaded a couple of music on our YouTube channel, just like work focus music, because we are like working with a lot of uh, remote uh, talents versus also companies. So both of them like need focus, you know, music time, because I usually like use music uh, for my work. 
So definitely a lot of scope out there. Now the last part of this conversation, again, it's a, a, a surprise one. I didn't mention that to you. Uh, uh, I usually like end uh, the sessions with founders more on like, you know, personalized side of things. And uh, we will ask you rapid fire questions. Uh, which is more on like, you know, your personal choices uh, as a founder, uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, so are you ready? Go for it. <laughs> okay. Name one other company and CEO that inspires you and why? Oh, man. Noah Breslow. Uh, he was uh, CEO of On Deck Capital, which was a um, uh, company where I started my career, alternative lending company. He's mm -hmm. a deeply motivating person. He's he can sort of see the he sees the chessboard and is very aware of what the moves look like four or five uh, moves out. And he's the kind of guy that you can you can jump between talking about you know machine learning uh, and and document extraction and then talk about capital markets. And you know the the, the change of gears is just like. So like easy for him. It's amazing. Session, right? We went from like automation to compliance and now we are like, you know, discussing entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, love it. Thank you for sharing that. What's one of the best business advice you've ever received? Just start. That's That really is like, there's so much to gain uh, from, from trying this. It isn't for everyone. It, it really is a, it's a, a very hard job, but it's a very fulfilling job. And you, you, I mean, you know, it, 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 you, you get to spend your time on such an uh, array of uh, interesting challenges. You get to learn a great deal. Uh, and it's a great privilege to, you know, design the culture uh, of the company that you want to work at. Like that is an amazing uh, privilege. So I, I, my advice is to do it. Start the company. Absolutely. Uh, I second that. What's one skill that has helped you become successful? Oh, boy. I, I, my answer to this in light of many things we've talked about is uh, sort of hilarious. Writing, honestly, like clarity of uh, communicating uh, using the written word is probably the single tool that uh, if I had to give all the others away, uh, I'd keep. Um, and then technical tools, uh, SQL's pretty useful. Uh, Python, pretty useful. Um, Absolutely. And like, you know, when uh, most of the founders that I've interviewed or met and are like, you know, part of my network, I know like they are good at really one thing, uh, which is like, you know, starting, which you said, actions, right? Taking action. And they are really like, you know, good salesmen, I would say, because they know how to sell themselves most of the time. Uh, but uh, uh, one skill that you mentioned about writing, I feel it gives a lot of clarity and clear communication to the team that you're managing. So, yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, uh, entrepreneur's journey is roller coaster, and we have challenges in day in and day out. Uh, managing like remote teams or like, you know, some uh, goals that we have to meet, uh, investment rounds that we have to raise. What keeps you going? What motivates you the most? Having the, the, the fulfillment that I get from having seriously solved a, a real problem for the customer is probably the answer to that for me. I just am so energized when, when you... Uh, when, when someone says, thank you for making this, this, this dramatically improved my, my world somehow, that there's nothing quite like that, you know? Absolutely. Uh, that gives you the most satisfaction and that keeps you going. Uh, thank you for sharing. Now, final question. Um, and I think uh, that is also my favorite one. Uh, what movie or a book or a TV show that changed your life? Mm. Uh, a book, The Great Game by uh, Peter Hopkirk. It's a, a story, uh, history, nonfiction about um, the sort of political um, jockeying between the, the Second British Empire and um, the Tsar in Russia. And it just explores like a lot of Central Asia, a place, part of the world that I'm really interested in. 
Oh, wow. Um, so that almost wraps up the session. Uh, before we like, you know, uh, say thank you for your time, I would like you to uh, uh, um, explain audience on how they can like, you know, come to Leica and start the journey with compliance. So if you want to share a word. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, our website is heylaika.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email, uh, I'm around. And we, uh, if you have compliance challenges or you want to talk more about compliance, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're starting companies and you want to talk about that, I'm around. Thank you so much, Austin. Uh, much appreciate your time today. Uh, I know yeah, thanks for having weekend, me. we're taking uh, time on like your uh, personal uh, busy weekend. Uh, so much appreciated. And no, thank, thank you. so much for everyone who joined today. Uh, uh, and listen to Austin uh, about automation and uh, some of the AI and other entrepreneur stuff we discussed. I hope that we get a chance to like you know hang around uh, together uh, sometime when I'm in New York. Yeah. But until next time, Austin, uh, thank you so much again. And uh, this is Sasan Lok signing off.